Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Changjing, for this um, kind introduction uh, and, of course, first of all, for the invitation to speak in your seminar. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great great pleasure for me. It has been some time ago that I was visiting Shanghai, uh, uh, and I would uh, love to be there again. Uh, but let's uh, uh, use the occasion to have this online seminar now, uh, and uh, where I can. Uh, talk about a recent result uh, that uh, we achieved uh, with the nuclear clock isomer scandium 45 uh, and, and um, uh, uh, making use of the most brilliant uh, source of x-rays in the world, the European free electron laser in Hamburg or near Hamburg. So this, uh, yeah, this should be uh, actually the recent publication. The title should be the agenda for today. It's uh, basically everything uh, well represented in the title where I'm going to talk about. So the first um, um, aspect will be um, a short feature about clocks, especially nuclear clocks and the history of their development. And um, then I will um, introduce also the isomer, the nuclear isomer scandium 45, um, which is not at all so exotic. Uh, all the scandium that we have that we use and for whatever purposes is scandium 45. So it's not a, it's a very abundant isotope. Um, then I will explain to you how we managed to resonantly excite a particular nuclear resonance of this isotope. And um, yeah, this, these are the main uh, topics in my agenda today. So um, as I promised, uh, I will talk about clocks. Uh, a little bit in the beginning to motivate the content of this presentation. So the measurement of time uh, is basically maybe one of the first scientific activities of humankind um, that was striving for increasing uh, precision in the measurement um, of time over the decades um, <clears throat> since uh, the first inception. So um, ranging from celestial, uh, the observation of periodic celestial motions. So this was, of course, the first instance of uh, a time signal, a periodic motion. Yeah, and uh, what else is there? Uh, the most the ideal, uh, the most obvious uh, periodic motion is the periodic uh, set of the sun and moon and stellar objects that people, uh, the early humans, could observe and use that as a measurement of time. However, with the um, evolution of mankind, then of course, other means for uh, measurement of time came online, so to say, uh, were invented. Um, first of all, mechanical clocks, yeah, that uh, of course offer a much higher precision than celestial bodies. Um, as we all know, um, mechanical clocks and uh, then uh, uh, much, much later, of course, also uh, solid state based watches like these wrist watches that uh, we all know and are still in use. So you see in the bottom, you see the respective fractional uncertainty of these um, <clears throat> time measurement devices that um, yeah already increased over several uh, centuries. And um, this was actually uh, getting a a much quicker pace then uh, towards extremely high um, uh, accuracies uh, when the first atomic clocks were invented. So uh, we all know the, uh, the famous um, cesium fountain clock uh, that uh, now nowadays provides uh, the definition of the second as a fundamental unit of time in, in international standards. And uh, also the uh, cesium clock, I mean, you see here the, the blue line uh, is the development, uh, the further development of the cesium or atomic fountain clocks here towards uh, fractional uncertainties uh, in the range of 10 to the minus 15. And um, <clears throat> uh, some of these clocks or variants of these clocks are now nowadays traveling on satellites uh, around uh, the Earth to uh, uh, constitute our global positioning systems. And um, um, and uh, yeah, there there might be yeah the evolution is ongoing to for, uh, enhanced uh, accuracies uh, with um, clocks that are based on uh, optical lattices where um, 
charged um, ions, particular ions are trapped in deep potentials, uh, and then probed uh, with uh, optical uh, means, laser radiation. Here we are actually uh, at a level of uh, accuracy of 10 to the minus 18 with the strontium 87 clock, which uh, actually corresponds to a uncertainty or deviation of the um, uh, reading of the clock in of one second in the age of the universe. So this is a remarkable uh, accuracy um, mm -hmm. that um, certainly goes beyond what is meaningful and practical everyday applications. But uh, here we are entering a regime where applications are in extreme metrology to probe, for example, uh, the uh, variation potential variations of fundamental constants as they are predicted by certain cosmological models. And uh, this is a driving force uh, towards increasing accuracies um, to probe uh, tiny, very tiny, extremely tiny uh, changes uh, of the environment uh, to probe relativistic uh, theory assumptions like a rotational redshift or uh, the equivalence principle to highest accuracies uh, to, to challenge actually the uh, assumptions of relativity theory, for example. So in this uh, respect, uh, nuclei come in uh, come on stage because they might offer uh, even higher accuracies than the currently available atomic uh, and optical clocks. Uh, so and that is actually that constitutes the uh, subject of my presentation today uh, to give you an account on a new candidate uh, on this stage, namely Scandium 45. Uh, <clears throat> but before I come closer to that, I want to give you an account of what is available um, today. Uh, so I just showed the uh, time temporal evolution of the development of clocks. Here is actually a, a list, uh, a map of um, some isotopes um, that and, and atomic transitions that qualify for high precision clocks here shown as a function of the natural line width of the transition that is always uh, involved. So uh, the basis uh, for for uh, um, atomic or nuclear, nuclear clock is always a ultra narrow atomic or uh, even nuclear level that provides a reference, a uh, very stable reference to which then any optical signal uh, or optical clockwork could then be related to by frequency combs or something. Um, so we have here um, the other axis, the vertical axis is the transition energy. And uh, we have here uh, various regimes. Here is the optical regime, um, also with the famous uh, thorium-229 isotope that I will uh, um, feature a little bit um, on the one of the next slides. And we have here the iron clock transitions that I have just shown you on the, on the previous slide. Uh, but uh, we, if we go up here, uh, we enter the regime of, of soft X-rays, where uh, there are um, uh, isotopes that belong to the class of, of Mersbauer isotopes. Um, and um, that's uh, actually, uh, yeah, there are not so many in the soft X-ray regime. There are more in the regime of hard X-rays extending from, say, 6 to 100 kilo electron volt transition energy and uh, here for example we have the most uh, widespread used Mersbauer isotope iron 57 which um, <clears throat> uh, has been serving as a uh, yeah one of the first isotopes uh, or nuclear transitions um, for the use in uh, metrology of uh, relativistic effects. So the first gravitational redshift experiment was, as you know, uh, done by Pound and Repka uh, on uh, using the iron 57 uh, Mersbauer isotope. It was then um, later there was another isotope, zinc uh, 67, which is not here on this uh, screen, um, <clears throat> that um, boosted actually the activity in uh, using nuclei uh, for uh, high precision um, uh, fundamental probing of um, relativity theory. So, um, and um, okay, so this is a bunch of Mersbauer isotopes that is also now in use in material science uh, to give an extremely uh, sensitive reference to probe um, uh, 
<clears throat> interactions, solid state interactions of um, um, of nuclei to probe actually solid state properties. Yeah. Um, so this is a widespread uh, use of many hundred groups worldwide are using these isotopes in material science. Um, but uh, for ultra uh, high uh, or extreme metrology, we uh, need to go further here to the left. Uh, so where actually these uh, di diagonal lines are parametrized according to the Q factor, the ratio of the transition energy uh, over the um, natural line widths. This gives the resonance quality factor Q, which is uh, then given here in, uh, in the, these um, uh, values um, uh, or with five, five orders of magnitude separation. So, and here we have, uh, for example, uh, at the Q equal 10 to the 20 year line, we have thorium uh, 229, but we also have uh, not far away from this uh, scandium 45. And uh, this will be the main actor here in this uh, talk today. And um, so, uh, yeah, I've mentioned uh, these two here um, already. So uh, let's uh, move on. Um, first, um, uh, for just for putting this into perspective, um, this is the uh, general scheme of an optical or nuclear clock. So uh, you have a uh, uh, either an atom uh, with an electronic level, which is very uh, narrow, or a nuclear um, <clears throat> uh, system, an, an atomic nucleus, which is orders of magnitude smaller, uh, of course, compared to uh, a uh, the atomic diameter, uh, but both are uh, exhibiting levels, uh, two level systems uh, with sufficiently uh, narrow uh, line widths uh, to qualify for high uh, and extreme con um, uh, extreme accuracy applications. So uh, these levels then are used as reference frequency uh, uh, for state detection or the, the uh, fluorescence radiation or whatever nuclear or atomic decay product is then monitored for state detection and frequency control uh, with which a stable laser is then uh, uh, stabilized, uh, which is then itself coupled to an optical clockwork, um, for example, a femtosecond laser uh, to actually generate then uh, via a frequency comb, for example, a time signal that can be read. So this is the, the very uh, scheme of, a, um, of an atomic or nuclear clock that would be needed to be implemented uh, in case that one even wants to use a nucleus actually for uh, a, a, a time a reference signal. So here is again a chart um, of the um, uh, uh, various traditions. Uh, so that here are even more uh, nuclear, these are all the nuclear isomers actually shown here. Um, again, uh, atomic shell transitions um, shown here, these are the various uh, ions that are um, considered and qualify. And uh, we have here the Mesbrough isotopes, again, with uh, iron 57 here in, the, uh, in, in this region. But we need to go uh, further to the right to see scandium 45. And here, uh, I show this actually to uh, explain you the, um, the, the, the values, the parameters that are relevant, of course, uh, here. Um, so the energy is 12.4 kV, the transition energy, which is almost um, exactly uh, one angstrom wavelength. Um, and uh, the line width, the resonant line width is 1.4 femto electron volt. So the six orders of magnitude smaller than the uh, um, natural line widths of iron 57. So we are entering really a new regime here uh, <coughs> compared to um, existing uh, Mesbrough isotopes, and the uh, yeah the scandium forty five is uh, in principle the uh, the narrowest, um, the most narrow uh, nuclear transition in the regime of hard X rays. There might be others actually uh, like scan uh, like uh, uh, rhodium hundred and three or silver hundred and nine, uh, which are on the other hand uh, orders of magnitude higher, uh, uh, not, uh, yeah, orders of magnitude higher in transition energy and also narrow, much more narrow in, in the in the frequency bandwidths uh, or the natural line widths so that uh, addressing these um, transitions would be uh, extremely challenging. So uh, scandium 45 is in a region uh, that is um, reasonably accessible uh, 
but um, not very easy. Uh, and I, I will explain you why and uh, what challenges we had to manage uh, to tackle uh, to to observe this um, resonance uh, for the first time uh, excited uh, from the ground state with X-ray laser radiation. Um, okay, so yeah, here is a list of uh, nuclear resonances. Here is the criterion that the uh, relative bandwidth um, um, should be smaller than that of iron 57. I mentioned uh, some isotopes, of course, the scandium and thorium, the silver as well, to uh, give you the detailed numbers here. Um, so uh, uh, I told you that I will give a short account on the thorium 229. That is a, a nuclear isomer that is actively um, uh, <clears throat> followed after since many decades for um, applications in the, um, as, a, as a nuclear clock, because the remarkable feature of the thorium is that the um, resonance energy, the transition energy is uh, 8.3 electron volt only. So that is the uh, lowest lying nuclear level that is known to date. And this could be addressed within um, uh, uh, an ultraviolet laser, for example, in principle, and that is that constitutes the driving force to to uh, use this isotope for applications in extreme metrology. So the uh, uh, the uh, Q factor is uh, that is the inverse of this quantity is ten to the twenty. I mentioned this already. The lifetime, natural lifetime, is several hundred or thousand seconds. Even that is not known exactly. It depends on the the ionization state in which the uh, uh, the, uh, this nucleus is in. So there is a huge lot of uh, applica um, uh, publications that have appeared in the past um, uh, years and decades. Uh, I have listed just um, uh, a few of the most recent ones. So the the progress is, is, is accelerating in principle. You will see more and more publications in uh, high profile uh, journals. And it might not be so far away from today uh, that um, uh, that there will be a, 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 an atomic clock or nuclear clock based on thorium-229. Um, so um, <clears throat> with using uh, nuclei, of course, uh, there's um, uh, there are a few aspects that are worth to be considered because uh, nuclei offer some, some um, uh, advantages, significant advantages over atomic resonances. And uh, those I... Uh, have listed here to motivate actually why it is worth to to look into nuclei. Uh, so first of all, uh, yeah, we have higher Q factors. Um, I just mentioned scandium and thorium as two examples. That would be one reason. Then of course the higher frequency, especially that of uh, scandium forty five, offers a greater stability uh, just for simple statistical reasons, because uh, uh, this higher higher frequency means. Um, a shorter period of the uh, carrier frequency so that fluctuations uh, from external sources are averaged over more cycles than in the optical regime. Uh, so this gives a greater stability um, and accuracy uh, <clears throat> from that simple reason. Then uh, due to the smallness of the uh, nucleus, uh, the geometrical size of the nucleus compared to the electron shell, it's, uh, the nucleus is much less sensitive to a uh, uh, um, uh, ambient electromagnetic fields uh, as compared uh, to what electrons are in atomic orbitals. Yeah, so uh, there are much uh, more um, uh, effects that uh, limit the um, accuracy of atomic uh, clocks um, <clears throat> and uh, that requires more shielding uh, or corrections to be made uh, to account for fundamental effects uh, like the shift of the uh, transition frequency just by thermal radiation and so on and uh, and, and uh, uh, many more of such effects where nuclei are much less susceptible to. Um, another example, another advantage is that a greater number of atoms can be used if you use the nuclei of the atom. Um, so uh, in principle, we can use scandium uh, and also thorium in a solid state matrix, uh, and we don't need, uh, uh, say, optical lattices or uh, traps uh, to um, have uh, clock atoms well separated uh, in a dilute gas or in iron crystals. 
at low temperatures to uh, control their mutual interaction. Um, so, so if you uh, have uh, nuclei embedded in a crystalline lattice, this is actually a natural, uh, <coughs> a nat natural lattice, like in a lattice clock, um, uh, 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 or a um, laser-generated uh, uh, opti optical lattice. Um, which also can yield very deep potentials, but uh, yeah, the the crystal and lattice with the strong binding forces uh, naturally gives you a uh, um, an, an, uh, a lattice uh, to stabilize the position of the uh, nuclei uh, that are supposed to be the frequency references. Um, yeah, and then we have the mass power effect, of course, uh, that is, uh, comes about due to the yeah. Uh, the deep potential in which the nuclei are bound in a solid, uh, and it also allows uh, one to uh, prepare a huge amount, uh, whatever, 10 to the 10 uh, or more nuclei in a, um, uh, in, in a solid, um, uh, which, which, are, which can be prepared all identical, and the huge number of these nuclei automatically uh, leads to a, a, a much uh, higher stability and uh, accuracy. Uh, uh, compared to a single uh, ion in a trap or a few ions in an in a optical lattice um, <clears throat> um, uh, simple for simple statistical reasons. Uh, and you can um, also uh, use moderately low temperatures uh, uh, if you use mass uh, nuclei in a, uh, in a solid state environment. Um, Okay, so these are a number of advantages that um, come into play if you use um, nuclei. However, I mean, it's still not trivial, as we will see, uh, to to make this work. Um, and uh, uh, now I want to focus here um, on, on the Scandium 45 as a uh, candidate, um, not too far away uh, regarding this value here from the Thorium-229, uh, but at, a, uh, at an energy that is... Uh, much higher where we um, uh, where we have uh, nowadays uh, radiation sources, X-ray lasers. Um, at least they are called X-ray lasers. They are not uh, true lasers like uh, optical lasers are, but they uh, offer uh, intense, high intense uh, beams uh, that um, allow us to address uh, this uh, uh, very narrow uh, level, as we will see and. Uh, the uh, lifetime is um, in the regime of uh, half a second, roughly. So <clears throat> that is also very convenient for uh, time-resolved detection techniques. And the greatest advantage is this 100% natural abundance. So we don't need complicated enrichment procedures uh, to, to get this material. We just buy it from a, 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 a chemical uh, or, or metal store um, uh, for, 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 chemical, for chemicals. Um, and uh, you can can handle this in principle in the, in the machine shop. Um, however, there are some requirements that uh, then need to be taken into account if one wants to really go to this value here. Uh, I can I come back to that later. So, um, so the fact that Scandium um, forty five is uh, coming on stage only now is um, the fact that there is no uh, convenient radioactive source available that could qualify for a uh, for for doing conventional mass power measurements yeah so there's uh, uh, mm -hmm. the branching ratio of any possible parent isotope um, to populate this 12.4 kV level the branching ratio is so small 10 to the minus 8 or lower that uh, there's no possibility to to uh, 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 produce a reasonable radioactive source for for doing uh, mass power measurements. Otherwise, it might have been done already since long time. Uh, but um, <clears throat> we have um, um, other sources that um, uh, allow uh, us to access this level uh, by exciting this from the ground state, yeah, not populating this from the higher uh, state of a parent uh, isotope that is populated in nuclear decay. But uh, using X-ray sources, uh, accelerator-driven X-ray sources like synchrotrons or lasers, we have the chance to um, <clears throat> excite this 12.4 um, kV level from the ground state. And uh, these these uh, attractive properties I mentioned already. Um, <clears throat> and um, let's uh, let's have a look what sources are available. 
um, and um, how we can uh, get them into work. Um, so that is the, the, the roadmap now. Uh, uh, that is actually uh, an idea that was um, already worked out by Yuri Shvitko and Gennar Smirnov uh, more than 30 years ago that um, the resonant excitation of Scandium 45 using uh, hard X-rays from accelerator-based sources. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this was published in this work here. Uh, where they came up already with some reasonable count rate uh, uh, or, or uh, estimates for um, uh, um, for the brilliance and the spectral flux needed actually to uh, generate a reasonable signal um, uh, from uh, Scandium uh, 45. Um, so since then, I mean, uh, since this work, uh, you see here all the parameters that I have mentioned, um, since this work, there were two attempts to uh, look at the Scandium 45 at third generation synchrotron sources. Uh, they were so far unsuccessful because simply because uh, the spectral brightness was uh, too low. Um, but um, it, um, in the meantime, uh, uh, considerations went on actually what uh, interesting science one can do with this um, resonance. So when there was the scientific case for the European XFL at that time in 2000, uh, still called the Tesla XFL, because it was part of a large linear accelerator that was planned near Hamburg. And this was a contribution from Juri Schwitko to this to a workshop um, on, um, on nuclear resonance scattering, potential nuclear resonance scattering experiments at, at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at the XFL uh, that was planned near Hamburg. And um, here you see again the scandium uh, parameters and an interesting application, namely what uh, actually uh, is uh, obvious. It, it was obvious after right after the discovery of the Mosbauer effect to use this ultra sharp resonance line for gravitational redshift experiments. This is of course here uh, also possible um, uh, under much um, different conditions because uh, in the pound Rapka experiment. Uh, the the height in the gravitational potential that was uh, used there was 22.5 meters. Uh, with the scandium, with the ultra narrow resonance of the scandium 40, uh, 45, you can decrease this height to a millimeter or below. Yeah, so you can probe um, um, gravitational redshift. Um, um, on on much uh, smaller length scales on length scales that are. Uh, not accessible yet uh, <clears throat> to probe um, um, gravitational uh, gravitational effects and test, for example, uh, and, and put new boundaries, uh, for example, or challenge the the equivalence principle of relativity theory uh, uh, to to um, to to scales uh, where it has not been probed yet. Um, so this is a yeah a potential application. So um, uh, here uh, actually. What is shown here is um, yeah, the uh, level shift uh, of the scandium levels um, of the scandium resonance energy when the photon or the, the, or the photon energy that is uh, changing uh, upon traveling along the gravitational potential of uh, one millimeter. Um, so this would be then uh, um, corresponding to uh, two shifted resonances on, on the energy scale. At the synchrotron, as uh, uh, what we are doing in the synchrotron, we convert uh, these when we do um, uh, when we excite hyperfine split levels at the synchrotron. We convert this um, uh, the energy spectrum into a temporal uh, into a, a pattern by simply by experimentally Fourier transforming this, and the split line would then in, in the, on the time scale correspond to a beating that one then would observe as an indication of the gravitational redshift in the, such a setting here, where we have two scandium foils on different gravitational potentials and a monochromator in between to shift to transversely displace the, 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 the photon beam. And here, um, yeah, this would be then uh, the uh, the signature actually, uh, uh, this beating, this temporal beating from the beating period, you would then be able uh, <clears throat> Um, to uh, to to get back the uh, to get the the energy um, difference the 
um, of, of uh, that corresponds to the the height um, and uh, the apparent weight of the photon actually uh, that you can probe in this fashion with it. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so that is uh, one one application that uh, one can think of um, once such an, an ultra narrow resonance is available. And um, now I want to come closer to our experiment that we uh, did uh, about a year ago, uh, <clears throat> or slightly more than a year ago, at the European Next Fell. Here again are the parameters. Here is actually now the level diagram in more detail. So we have a 12.4 keV level uh, <clears throat> of the uh, scandium, and we pump this level here with uh, photons from uh, the, the laser. And the decay can proceed over uh, different channels, either, of course, the radiative, completely radiative decay by 12.4 keV radiation. But the more likely uh, decay channel is the internal conversion, I see mentioned here. Uh, which is 99% uh, uh, or more of all the case proceeding through this non-radiative channel where the nucleus, uh, the uh, excitation energy of the nucleus is then uh, transferred to an uh, inner electron uh, of uh, 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 <coughs> an inner shell, uh, the K shell of the um, electron shell and um, that's uh, great. Uh, those are these electrons that have a finite probability amplitude at the nucleus that uh, then are susceptible to take away the energy by this internal conversion decay where a proton uh, captures an electron and converts into a neutron uh, and uh, the remaining hole in the inner shell electron shell is then filled by uh, electrons from the upper shells uh, leading to uh, k alpha and k beta dominantly uh, fluorescence radiation and that is, that is the decay channel that we are going to detect. Uh, that is the idea. Uh, and uh, um, what is here written on the right, I have mentioned um, already. So, but here for the uh, for the remainder of the uh, or for the coming slides, it's important uh, to to know that we are for for the first experiment we decided to detect this uh, uh, fluorescence radiation, which has an energy of about four kilo kilo electron volt. Um, so that is one uh, aspect. Um, then the question, uh, why uh, using the European x um that is um, actually a unique um, accelerator-driven laser source uh, uh, right now, of all, although there are many more in the world or, uh, meanwhile, and, uh, and many more are coming online soon. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, However, the European x is especially suited uh, due to its high energy and its, its superconducting accelerator technology to uh, 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 radiate in the hard X-ray regime uh, to um, <coughs> set also up a seeding scheme um, where um, the uh, radiation through the under, uh, generated in the chain of undulators is amplified even, even more. Uh, there is a high rep rate available uh, that um, gives a, a high number of pulses with high uh, pulse energy for uh, uh, <clears throat> especially suited for um, generating a high spectral flux um, that is a um, principal um, factor of up to a thousand larger than those of conventional circular radiation sources uh, that are available uh, these days. Um, <clears throat> so the... Um, yeah, the European x is uh, the, basically the first uh, high repetition rate X-ray free electron laser uh, with the uh, uh, bunch spacing of um, um, of about uh, uh, yeah two hundred or four hundred uh, nanoseconds. So the uh, temporal um, pulse sequence uh, of this particular mode uh, where the x European x is running is shown here. So the, the standard mode uh, are uh, bunch trains with a user-defined number of bunches that can be up to uh, 300, 400, or in the later stages, maybe even 2,800, um, <clears throat> separated by 100 milliseconds. Uh, so the intrinsic repetition rate of these bunch trains is 10 hertz. And um, so uh, and you see already that this uh, time structure is ideally suited for the detection of the scanning resonance. 
because yeah, from the perspective of this of the lifetime of the scandium, these these pulse trains, these trains of many uh, short uh, time separated pulses um, uh, appears as a single bunch, which uh, with a duration that is much shorter than the lifetime of the scandium resonance. So that's uh, typically uh, even if you have hundred bunches with a separation of 200 nanoseconds, you are below one millisecond in total length here. And then you have 100 milliseconds or slightly less than 100 milliseconds time uh, to where, where no excitation occurs. Uh, in that time, you can look for the delayed uh, nuclear fluorescence uh, or these four point, uh, the, these four keV um, fluorescence photons uh, emitted from the scandium nuclei. So this is, un uh, yeah, this, this uh, time structure is really suited uh, for this resonance. And uh, it was only a few day, a few years ago that this uh, so-called hard X-ray self-seeding mode, uh, I will show that uh, later, became available. Uh, that uh, gives you an order of magnitude more spectral flux, uh, as shown here in this line, uh, compared to the conventional SARS self-amplified spontaneous emission uh, uh, principle. Uh, that is the standard operation of these uh, standard mechanism of uh, radiation generation of these. X-ray laser sources. Um, yeah, here here is the experimental setup, uh, and here it's a bit more illustrated how this hard X-ray self seeding works. That is, was also crucial actually to reach the the critical photon spectral photon flux uh, that we estimated to be needed for the uh, detection of the scandium resonance. So uh, this works in a way that uh, uh, <clears throat> um, that. Between uh, in, in, within the undulator section of the uh, X-ray laser, uh, between two undulators, there is a space for crystal in reflection. The crystal in reflection basically sorts out or selects a certain mode um, of um, uh, the um, SARSA radiation. A certain spike actually here of the SARSA radiation. I hope you can uh, see it here. Uh, so the normal operation is that the um, radiation generated in, in such a SASA process is is uh, <coughs> um, is uh, based on amplification amplification of radiation that uh, generates uh, itself from from noise uh, yeah of the electromagnetic uh, field in the in the undulator so it's it's quite spiky actually um, uh, pattern it varies from pulse to pulse. And um, <clears throat> so th this pulse is uh, maybe 100 femtoseconds long here. Uh, and the spikes here uh, are, are only a few femtoseconds. Um, so if you put a crystal here inside, you uh, would uh, be able to select out of this relatively broad energy band a single spike and use this actually then for further amplification. So in principle, you, you use the... Uh, um, uh, the radiation or that or what is left over and that is actually a hole in the in the spectrum uh, but uh, uh, for the amplification process that doesn't matter um, uh, if uh, the uh, bunch overlaps with the wake of the delayed wake of this uh, <coughs> uh, radiation transmitted to this uh, break reflection uh, break crystal um, then you are effectively are able to amplify a single spike of this uh, um, uh, noisy, noisy pattern here and uh, continue to amplify it in the further uh, uh, section of the, the undulator sequence here. So, uh, of course, yeah, this is all what we use. This leads to a, a pulse widths of about uh, one uh, electron volt or even less maybe uh, uh, of the desired energy. And um, so this is the radiation source here. And uh, then um, we have here the uh, scandium-45 sample um, with the resonance detection unit. Uh, and this is the trick here uh, that we applied. I have the animation uh, um, uh, here below. Um, so we have here this foil and we move the foil uh, in and out of the beam. Uh, it's in the beam for being excited, and then we move it within 10, 20 milliseconds uh, into the place between two detectors where uh, we cover a rather large solid angle uh, to detect the 4 keV fluorescence photons. Uh, so this is possible with a fast mechanical shutter. 
uh, on which this uh, scandium foil is mounted. And this is uh, shown here in this animation. So you uh, have uh, the, bunch, uh, the, the bunch train coming from the left now, yeah, uh, exciting the resonance. Quickly, uh, the sample is moved between the two detector telescopes here uh, of these solid state drift detectors. And, uh, and, and this is periodically uh, repeated with a web rate of 10 Hertz <coughs> to actually um, uh, reach a detection condition, which is extremely low noise. So we have a strong shielding here of the detectors from the very strong incident beam. We have a motion of about 12 millimeters uh, far away from the position of the incident beam. And we have intrinsically uh, low noise detectors, these silicon drift detectors are low noise. They have a, a excellent energy resolution so that we could select the 4 keV uh, resonance, uh, fluorescence radiation um, with, a, with a high signal to noise ratio and separate them from all parasitic uh, photons uh, that might have been entering the detectors at the same time. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, yeah this is the detector uh, the, the the shutter unit here that was a simply laser shutter from from Torlabs that we modified uh, for this operation here, and here are the silicon uh, drift detectors that uh, we used uh, that were covering a rather good uh, solid angle around the sample, and. Um, yeah, last but not least, um, of course, uh, that is what I mentioned already here on the right side um, is the uh, section where we measure the photon energy. So once we had found the resonance, it was, of course, the next important step was to measure the resonance energy. Yeah, so the resonance energy uh, uh, was known before only to an accuracy of plus minus 50 electron volt. That is a really lousy uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, <clears throat> Um, so uh, we were aiming at a much higher accuracy, of course, uh, as an important requisite for any further applications. Yeah? So you need a, a, an exact value of the resonance energy. And for that purposes, we used uh, two crystal spectrometers, one for, for a quick monitoring of the relative energy and then uh, a, a high resolution crystal for applying the bond method. Uh, in the bond method, you measure two reflections of a sing uh, of a perfect single crystal, and from the angular separation of the two break reflections and the known lattice constant of the silicon, uh, <clears throat> one can uh, determine the absolute energy of the photons with a very high accuracy. That was the key, actually, uh, uh, to to the main result of our our uh, experiment. Um, I should also mention that uh, the heat load uh, of the radiation is, of course, an issue. Uh, so we haven't used any monochromator in between. We used a direct beam from the uh, from the uh, undulators of the free electron laser. Um, we widened the beam up. Uh, uh, we uh, <coughs> distributed the heat load over a sufficiently large area so that we were below the uh, limit, uh, the, the the critical limit uh, for, for melting the sample. Um, but that, that was, an, uh, of course, an important aspect as well. Um, OK, this is uh, basically the, the experimental setup and uh, that we uh, 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 used at the European XFEL. And this, this is the data. Uh, yeah, so what is shown here? So we have uh, uh, orange and blue spots here these are every spot is a single photon detected uh, and parametrized or sorted after incident energy of the incoming photons and the detector energy uh, so the uh, amtec detectors are energy energy resolving detectors uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, with a very good energy resolution so that is the energy range that they cover from uh, say one kilo, uh, kilo electron volt up to 25 kilo electron volt and um, so here you see all the events uh, that we recorded. And um, there are interesting regions. So you can imagine that this here, the zero here in this uh, graph is already the center. Uh, here is the very resonance. Uh, I'll give the value later here. But here you see, actually, if you enlarge this region here, you see uh, two uh, accumulations of uh, detection events that are matching with the energies uh, 4.01 keV and 4.45 keV for K-alpha and K-beta fluorescence photons. 
Um, so that is a proof, a clear proof that indeed the uh, the, the nuclear resonance was excited, uh, and and this was actually uh, yeah, all these photons were already time gated, so uh, the the detector were uh, switched on only twenty milliseconds after uh, the excitation pulse came, so that we only recorded the afterglow, so to say, the delayed. Uh, 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 luminescence or fluorescence, one should better say, of the scandium atoms after excitation. So this contributed also to this very high signal-to-noise ratio uh, that we achieved here. And uh, so this is what I mentioned already, these clusters, that is the direct confirmation of the detection. Then we have looked here also at the 12.4 keV uh, uh, section here, but there uh, was no statistically significant emission. So that would be the elastic uh, nuclear fluorescence or forward scattering um, that we would um, uh, expect to see here, but the experimental conditions were not optimized in that uh, uh, stage for detection of those photons. So, uh, um, and uh, also theoretical simulations indicate that we should have had a much more, much thicker sample to observe this uh, decay channel here. So everything is consistent with expectations. So this uh, was ensured that we were really on resonance here in this situation. And um, yeah, and this is actually, if you integrate now here over, over this region here uh, and plot the number of photon events um, uh, as a function of this uh, energy here. Uh, so, so the blue, the color code here is uh, just uh, between the two detectors uh, actually. Uh, so the one was in forward direction, uh, the one in backward direction. Those are the, these are the signals from the two AMTEC detectors that we employed. Um, Okay, um, so then integration over the uh, detector energy range and plotting the histogram as a function of the incident photon energy gives you this resonance curve here, um, corresponding, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, we had, initially we had a large scan range. Uh, this was then confined to a plus minus four electron volt. Uh, and uh, in, um, uh, in the experiment in the whole measurement time, there were 10 to the 20 12.4 kV photons incident hitting on the on the target foil. And uh, so uh, in this respect, it's a, a remarkable signal to noise and ratio at a remarkable uh, selection uh, and discrimination uh, uh, capability of this experiment to record uh, uh, about these are about uh, to be exact 93, we counted them later, 93. 4 keV fluorescence photons were detected uh, here uh, in this uh, in this curve um, um, out of 10 to the 20. So this is a remarkable ratio that allowed us then uh, uh, <clears throat> by carefully calibrating the, the photon energy to determine the absolute resonance energy, uh, uh, which is given now uh, by this value here. And uh, so uh, the literature value before was 12.4 plus minus 50 electron volt. Uh, now we have 12.389.59 with these uh, errors here given. And um, so uh, this is an, a remarkable achievement uh, that uh, enables us uh, for the next uh, experiments to directly go to this energy and, and, and uh, uh, be sure that we are on resonance. Um, so... Yeah, so we uh, actually uh, improved uh, some of the literature values of the scandium 45. Uh, of course, first of all, the resonance energy as shown here, but also uh, in um, setting and uh, comparing the numbers, the, the, um, the yield of fluorescence photons uh, resulting from the internal conversion decay, we could actually uh, re get a refinement on the uh, uh, internal con, uh, conversion coefficients here to, to those values for the total uh, or the K uh, alpha conversion uh, efficiency or, 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 or conversion coefficient. So these are the, the, the green shaded regions here where we have uh, new numbers. We also got a uh, new numbers for the uh, for the resonant uh, cross section, uh, which yeah um, is still within the, the range. No, it's, it's uh, definitely larger than the literature value that was published before. <laughs> so these are new parameters that are uh, uh, resulting from this, this work. And um, um, yeah, so there are, are interesting uh, new uh, uh, next steps to be done or needed to be done. 
so we have uh, submitted a follow-up proposal. Um, uh, we want to look then for this uh, coherent forward scattering channel where actually um, this um, channel that I've shown at 12.4 kV where, where we didn't see a signal yet. So um, uh, because the conditions were not optimized for optimization, we need actually a thicker foil. We need to cool down the uh, sample to temperatures below 30 Kelvin uh, to avoid um, uh, uh, line broadening due to the second order Doppler, sh Doppler if, uh, shift. And uh, but then if, if this is successful and uh, we estimate a relatively high count rate, at least a factor of 10 more uh, than um, in the in the present experiment, then we can think about um, for example, the first gravitational redshift experiments on millimeter or submillimeter scales, or to measure even extremely weak uh, hyperfine couplings uh, of the nuclei um, in in a solid state environment, which hasn't been done before at all, uh, and would uh, open a new regime of studying hyperfine interactions. Um, and uh, yeah, so we want to improve the determination of the resonance energy even further. Uh, one order of magnitude should be possible with. Uh, sufficiently well prepared x-ray optics uh, this would be also would be also needed uh, then to eventually develop a, a milli ev monochromator for future experiments um, a milli ev bandwidth monochromator and um, yeah and uh, of course we also want to determine the lifetime uh, of the, the single atom incoherent lifetime in the photonic decay channel uh, which is also not known yet uh, because uh, so far, all uh, studies before our X-ray laser experiments, all the studies were uh, made on based on nuclear reactions where this scandium forty five was um, <clears throat> uh, produced, uh, where actually the uh, the the excited uh, state was um, uh, populated by um, completely different uh, decay channels and not by a photonic uh, uh, excitation from the ground state. Uh, so um, and and this might be uh, yeah uh, need to be addressed in another experiment uh, to to uh, compare the lifetime measured in this decay channel compared to the existing measurements. Yeah, with this uh, I'm coming closer uh, to the end, but I don't want to uh, close without an outlook actually uh, on on the future. Of course, uh, as you have seen with the European x fell even with the brightest X-ray laser source in the world at the moment, uh, at 12.4 uh, keV, uh, the count rate was uh, uh, still pretty low. I mean, 93 photons within 40 days of measurement time is not not a lot, <laughs> uh, but of course it was, as you saw, uh, statistically very significant. But for future applications, one uh, should have a a source that is uh, spectrally much brighter and uh, there is a candidate uh, that is being researched on at the moment uh, quite actively at many facilities uh, this is the x-ray free lecton laser oscillator uh, and that is a uh, principle shown here in a, a sketch where actually the um, the uh, an undulator is used for a per periodic seeding of the photon beam. Periodic means uh, that uh, yeah, you, you you use the radiation that is uh, so the electron bunches are coming from here, so they are uh, running through the undulator and then uh, uh, hitting a crystal that is part of a recirculation cavity. So uh, the radiation uh, then is uh, guided. So this pathway, uh, there, there are other possibilities uh, also possible, but this is uh, a typical the typical shape of a recirculation cavity as used in optical lasers as well. So that is actually uh, used to to feed in the radiation, uh, the X rays, um, again into the entrance of the annulator and use them for for seeding uh, 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 again. So if they are coincident with the electron with the next electron bunch here, so uh, the the radiation um, is used uh, uh, to uh, micro to, uh, to actually um, create micro bunching of the electron beams and uh, amplify the uh, photonic output even further. So the, the more uh, uh, 
the more repetitions here you have for the photons inside of this recirculation cavity, the higher the gain could be. And uh, eventually, if you couple this out, you get an increase in brilliance, as shown here, that can be orders of magnitude higher than uh, what is available here at, at present day X ray uh, laser sources here. This is uh, maybe a little bit optimistic, but um, uh, that remains to be seen. These are calculations um, being made. Uh, but in any case, uh, <clears throat> if such a facility would be available, that would actually boost the research uh, on ultra narrow nuclear resonances for extreme metrology applications. Um, so a, a nuclear clock in a, in, a, in, a, in a strict sense might still be uh, many steps further away in the future. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, um, on the way uh, to the development of a nuclear clock, we will have then a, uh, a source available uh, to use uh, scandium resonance, scandium 45 resonance for applications in extreme metrology. Yeah, and the nuclear a clock in principle uh, can be seen also as a, as a high precision measurement device for time and energy in principle. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, um, we will always based, uh, be based on uh, or rely on an accelerator-driven source, and we will certainly not be able to uh, uh, produce in the near future a compact uh, atomic clock that uh, can be mounted on a satellite and orbit uh, the, the Earth um, to uh, be a reference uh, for the global positioning system or <clears throat> any other navigation system. Uh, but for earthbound, high, uh, extremely high metrology applications, this could be an extremely interesting isotope. So I don't want to close without uh, mentioning my uh, co-workers. So this was uh, done in an international collaboration led by Yuri Schwitko uh, from Argonne National Lab uh, with uh, uh, me, SAPI, uh, Jörg Evers uh, from Heidelberg and um, Olga Kotarovskaya from Texas A&M University. Uh, and uh, extremely uh, motivated and <clears throat> active uh, help of uh, the uh, technical and, and uh, scientific personnel at DAISY and the European XFEL uh, was crucial actually for the success of this experiment, uh, preparing the experimental setup, uh, the uh, environment, and running the uh, accelerators um, and the beamline, that was was a really a, a excellent team effort. Um, yeah, and uh, this is then um, my, my summary with this uh, picture here, which uh, actually uh, summarizes all the ingredient that we used. We actually you see here a nucleus that is illuminated. Uh, you may guess the scandium-45 nucleus that is illuminated by the very bright light from an X-ray laser and excited, and eventually uh, the excitation energy is transferred to some electrons here in the cell. They are kicked out, and uh, uh, if they uh, if the holes are then filled by other electrons, uh, then we get the fluorescence radiation, which is not not shown here. Uh, but anyway, I mean it's uh, here. Uh, the nucleus is drawn as a clockwork in principle, already anticipating the application of a clock, and. Uh, and the 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 the, uh, the hands of this clock actually are not uh, random, but they encode actually in the time that is displayed. They encode the resonance energy of the scandium uh, forty five resonance. Yeah, and uh, with this, uh, I want to thank you very much for attention and thank you again for the invitation to your seminar. Okay. Thank Professor Hosberg for this very impressive talk. So it's, I think it's time for questions. Yeah, I'm looking forward. Uh, dear Professor? Yes. Uh, okay, I want to ask uh, a question. Uh, uh, what's the um, best method to ex uh, accept uh, the uh two two nine uh th that is a two twenty nine thorium yeah 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 uh, the, uh, what's the best method to to exciting uh, to accept uh, the uh, atom I, I don't, didn't get the question exactly I mean uh, you you mean the the way how to excite the thorium. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. The way uh to accepted accepted uh, the uh thorium, yeah. yeah. The thorium, I mean, that is still to be be done. Uh, that has not been achieved yet, at least not from the ground state. Um, um. Uh, as as we did, I mean, uh, in this in this uh, way, uh, we are the first to excite such a small uh, a narrow band resonance from the ground state. For thorium, it has not been achieved yet because the uh, the the resonance energy is uh, not known yet to a sufficient precision to build a corresponding laser uh, to address this resonance with sufficient high intensity. That is the current state. Of the art uh, that um, uh, the resonance energy is, um, yeah, uh, they are making progress. They, uh, they are narrowing down the bandwidth in uh, in which the uh, exact resonance energy is um, uh, expected. Uh, that's what I, I know. Um, but uh, the, the critical, the crucial point is actually the measurement of the exact transition energy. Um, and and then uh, yeah, also there's laser development going on at various institutes around the world, uh, and it is also not uh, very uh, easy to uh, <clears throat> um, design and um, commission and operate a laser at uh, 150 nanometer wavelengths. That is what the uh, energy would correspond to, because uh, that is, that is uh, this radiation is highly absorbed in, in any material. Uh, and the efficiency of, uh, say, a high harmonic generation uh, or other mechanisms is not very high. Uh, um, what I was told, so, but I'm not an expert in in this. But there are arguments actually uh, that I mentioned uh, that they uh, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> they make it uh, difficult actually to uh, to find a source to um, to excite this resonance directly, but. But colleagues are, are optimistic that they might uh, be uh, ready uh, to reach this goal within the next uh, uh, few years or maybe even sooner. I don't know. Okay, uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, uh, you can uh, uh, use this uh, or electrons. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, some um, uh, some uh, method is you is you use to uh uh electron uh uh to excite it uh uh -huh. the uh the, uh I mean, so was it Bremsstrahl? But as N E C or or E or like electron bridge ah with the electron bridge yeah, yeah they are. Yeah. Yeah, so there were also considerations, but I, I'm I'm not aware of uh, any experimental progress in this. I think uh, until now there is no experiment. Yeah, there's no. I, yeah, that's what I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There is no experiment uh, about uh, the the uh, method. At least there's no no result published yet. Maybe the <laughs> we we don't know. Yeah. So uh, Zhang Jing, you you worked on the electron bridge process as well, right, with Adriana? Um, not 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 too much. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, I think there is no experiment about yeah, this, uh, especially for tutorium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have uh, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, Please. actually, I think someone will ask because the SFP is very large. Yes. I think it's a, it's a, maybe it's a disadvantage to build a clock based on SFP. It's too large. So how do you think about this? <laughs> good good question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, there are uh, activities uh, worldwide to, to uh, use uh, other mechanisms uh, for generating uh, hard X-ray, highly uh, brilliant X-rays from 
um, other types of acceleration or particle uh, acceleration mechanisms like plasma uh, uh, wakefield accelerators mm -hmm. and so on uh, that can have uh, much higher uh, gradients uh, acceleration gradients than this uh, conventional um, uh, superconducting cavity approach uh, which uh, leads to these kilometer long uh, uh, accelerators so um, yeah in principle if this can be uh, this uh, this um, uh, plasma driven uh, acceleration mechanisms if they can generate sufficiently high uh, spectral flux i mean then it is of course an option yeah but um, mm -hmm. but the, the the i mean the principle has been shown that this this type of uh, acceleration works uh, uh, but the the spectral flux and the total photon yield uh, is still uh, comparatively low uh, if this can be uh, uh, um, amplified to much higher values um then um then that, that could be a, a a way to obtain radiation sources say on a on a scale of a lab yeah <laughs> um that fits into a lab and then uh, it, it it would be more compact yeah uh, but um um yeah so that is um that is the um uh, perspective which is um certainly will not yield uh, significant progress in the in the next years that will take a while uh, mm -hmm. but, but uh, uh, until then i mean we still need to do a lot of work uh, to further use and further get this resonance ready uh, in a way for example that we are able to uh, to have single line uh, scandium samples uh, which are not uh, uh, subject to uh, line broadening, inhomogeneous broadening, um, uh, <clears throat> and uh, um, this this uh, this is, is the uh, aim of the next experiment to first of all characterize this and then uh, go on and uh, develop preparation techniques where the scandium is then really in a single line uh, condition in the solid state matrix. That is the next challenging step, and for that we still need the the, the large scale X-ray lasers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think and, it's a very and, interesting and promising area. Yeah, so yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, uh, except scalium, do you have any other candidate to excite? Uh, not really yet. I mean, theoretically, yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, this, the silver hundred and nine that I mentioned and the rhodium hundred and three, they were candidates, but. <laughs> I think this is far from being realistic um, um, at the moment, although on, on paper they have much narrower lines even. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I think it would be uh, too daring actually to uh, trying to approach them uh, uh, experimentally in the, in the next years to come. Uh, so one should direct all efforts to the scandium, which is really a, a, an extremely good candidate um, to work to work with in principle um and because it, it comes very close to the thorium and then one can uh, also learn all these steps uh, how to prepare this and if one has if one knows how to how to get the the, the scandium working i mean then from this experience one, one can maybe go on further to even narrower uh, uh transitions um like the rhodium or the silver yeah, but okay. they have much higher uh, energies. It, it is a challenge, and uh, um, so I mean the the, the twelve point four. I think KEV is still a spot where one can make good progress in the next years. Okay, thank you. So, do you have any other questions? Let me see. Doesn't look so. No. Yes. Okay, maybe it's too close to the holidays. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, if there's no further questions, let's thank Professor Postback again. Thank you, Raf. Thank you, Zhang Jing. Okay. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure to to be in your seminar, and uh, 
And uh, <clears throat> but maybe next time we can meet in person somewhere, maybe in China when I'm there in November. Yeah. So and <laughs> maybe also in in, yeah. in Hamburg. Or if you if you are in Germany again, let me know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think there will be a conference in Aux in Hamburg. Yeah, it's a synchrotron radiation and simulation conference. In, uh, yeah, I think uh, I will be there. Okay, good. Yeah, then yeah, then let, let's meet in August. Yeah. Let's see you later. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.